So welcome uh, everybody to this uh, week's uh, lecture. Uh, today I'm uh, very happy to, to have with us two distinguished speakers, Edoardo Sinibaldi from uh, the IIT in Genova, the Italian Institute of Technology, which is one of the leading institutions um, in Italy performing research, uh, actually not just in robotics and AI, but also nanotechnology and, um, and neurosciences, to, to quote a few. And uh, Josh Bongard from the University of Vermont, uh, that, as you know, is one of the two authors, actually the younger authors of how the body shapes the way uh, we think, which is uh, actually our textbook and uh, the main inspiration uh, of this series of lectures. Uh, so, the uh, so today I, I, I will just uh, uh, moderate and introduce the speakers. Uh, so it's a free day, free holiday day for me today. And uh, so I leave uh, the floor to the first uh, speaker, Eduardo Sinibaldi from uh, uh, the IIT, who will talk about modeling of uh, natural and uh, artificial systems that, as you, as you may think, it is a core issue because we are always talking about bio-inspiration, uh, about exploiting the principle <coughs> of organization of, uh, of natural systems, but this also uh, boils down to having uh, good methods uh, to model uh, a system, whether it is uh, designed by humans or uh, coming from uh, the evolution. So now I leave the floor to, to Edoardo. Okay, so thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks, Fabio, for this very kind invitation. I'm very, let's say, uh, glad to deliver this Shanghai lecture. That's titled Model Based Orienteering, uh, let's say, where to go, where not to go, and imaginative trails. And which is aimed to illustrate, let's say, a manifold model, let's say, natural form modeling. And I will do this by, let's say, recalling three stories. The first one, which is titled Where to Go, uh, tells how models can be used to understand the operating condition on natural systems up to deriving bio-inspired and biometric artificial devices. The second one, titled Where Not to Go, deals with strategy. So our models can help us change take on a given problem. Whereas the third one, it's a crazy link in between, let's say, music and flexible robotics. And I will span soft robotics, biomedical robotics, and creative engineering uh, balancing some concepts with some technical details to take you along. Okay, let's have a break uh, by recalling this quite popular sentence in the Shanghai lectures. That's why do plants not have brains? The answer is actually quite simple. They don't have to move by water. Fine, but plants move, and that's the story of plant-inspired osmotic equation. And indeed, plants can really, let's say, uh, are capable of amazing movement. Here you can see, let's say, slow movements, just an example here. So the only reversible example you can see is here, the, the, let's say the root grow very slow, occurring on, a, let's say, with speeds below one millimeter per hour, so let's say, just to give you some reference, but it's variable depending on the environmental condition, actually. The other three examples you can see here, let's say, the cyclic opening and closing of the stomata guard cell or leaf transpiration occurs over, let's say, many hours, uh, the closing of the leaf of Mimosa pudica, it seems to be fast because it involves a small organ called pulvinus at the base of the leaf. And it occurs, let's say, upon some, let's say, triggering by touch cues. And this slow movement here, occurring over, let's say, several minutes, is the movement of leaf and tentacles of the drosera. And here, let's say, it has plenty of time also because these tiny droplets you can see here are biodesic, so there is no way out for this spray. These movements are, let's say, sensibly different from this other movement that I can illustrate here. So let me just replay, for instance, this movie for you. Have a look here, this kind of catapult-like mechanism, 
you can see this is, let's say, a snap through of this pollination column of this silidium debile. That's quite similar to, let's say, the fast closing of the very well known leaves of the Venus by trap upon triggering by, let's say, some prey of tiny hairs here on the inner surface of the leaf. And indeed, this is a bistable structure. So this structure here has a two stable configuration associated with two different curvatures. And the, the leaf can really snap very, very quickly from one to the other uh, upon these touch cues. And these movements both are very, very fast because they also involve some kind of mechanical instabilities. So, however, whenever the penis has to reopen the leaves or let's say this medium has to, let's say, recharge this kind of catapult-like mechanism, these will occur over a longer time scale. So the reopening will be slow, like the previous movement. Why? Because it's just purely water-driven. Indeed, there is a clear boundary in between, let's say, purely water-driven movements and um, movements also involving mechanical instabilities. And here you can see, for instance, in these slides, uh, there are some simplifications for cell uh, radio, so, sorry, for plant cell or plant tissue that, let's say, fast movements here are, let's say, sharply separated by slow movement by a kind of theoretical boundary that depends on the length scale of the system, on the elastic properties, on the hydraulic properties of the system. So, for instance, the Venus by trap is here, whereas the Drosser is here. And these slow movements are interesting for my robotics applications because they are intrinsically related to low power consumption. And osmosis is a key player therein. That's why we started years ago uh, by modeling this modeling process. Let me just remind you that osmosis is water transport uh, into a solution uh, with a salt. You may think of, let's say, common uh, sodium chloride, that's, let's say, kitchen salt, uh, where it's, it's more concentrated. So here I have two solutions. Here, in this right solution, the salt is uh, with a higher concentration, and this is calling for this kind of water flux crossing this membrane here, that ideally it's permeable to water, but it's impermeable to the salt. And indeed, cell torgor, that is a kind of a natural hardness for plants, it's generated by this water transport due to the different concentration of osmolite through the cell wall and the plasma membrane. So this is the driver, and plants can, let's say, coordinate this water transport as to achieve kind of microscopic movements. And the basic idea is quite simple. So you have kind of reservoir with, the, let's say, water, and you have a osmotic membrane here, and you have tiny volume, that's, let's say, the actuation chamber, <clears throat> and you allow for water transport here that's driven by the difference in the osmotic pressure that relates to the different concentration, and it's opposed by the difference in the hydrostatic pressure. And we allow a portion of the boundary to be displaceable or deformable to allow for the interfacing with the kind of external environment, for instance, by pushing an elastic load, like let's say pushing a linear spring, or let's say bulging some kind of elastic membrane. In both cases, you can relate the internal pressure in the actuation chamber to the increase in volume, and you end up with a simple mathematical model that's just an ordinary differential equations that can be integrated analytically. So in these cases, you can really derive the performance metrics of actuation, that's basically the characteristic time, the maximum force, the peak power, the power density being the peak power divided by the volume of the device, the actuation works that the energy up to regime and the energy density being the energy divided by the volume. In terms of, let's say, geometrical properties and material properties of the device, for instance, the typical length scale of the device, let's say the initial small concentration. This is, let's say, related to the elastic properties of the membrane. This is related to, the, let's say, the hydraulic properties of the osmotic membrane. And so, Having this very simple expression, you can, for instance, understand that if you aim to obtain an actuation of having, let's say, one million time scale, you shouldn't exceed, or let's say, some choice of the other parameters, a length scale that's around 10 millimeters. Otherwise, it's too slow, or it becomes, let's say, ineffective. So starting from this, we design, let's say, uh, the first, let's say, osmotic actuators. And here you can see the embodiment of the actuation chamber, tiny chamber, the budging membrane, some ceilings, and here you can see the osmotic membrane that's supposed, let's say, a uh, frame in between two metallic cages, because here, in these tiny devices, we are working with a pressure as high as, let's say, 10 atmospheres, so it's quite remarkable. And here, you can see, let's say, the physical embodiment. Whenever you add water, that is your solvent, actuation starts, and here the model was predicting an actuation time around two millimeters that was nicely matched by the experiments. And the experiments could also nicely match and predict, let's say, the 
uh, dynamics of the bulging membrane, let's say the scaling of the force rate with the molarity, that's concentration. So everything that very simple model could predict was, let's say, nicely observed. And we could, for instance, demonstrate embodiment for uh, releasing a preloaded mechanism that's, let's say, osmosis-based triggering of a preloaded mechanism here that would be, let's say, could be ideally similar to, let's say, the release of the pollination column in the selenium divide, or if you wish, just, let's say, a purely water-driven movement, like raising of this uh, very heavy bar, this is, let's say, a two kilogram bars, that's raised by just the protrusion of an elastomeric membrane here, just five millimeter uh, diameter. So this is capable of producing more than 20 newtons. So it's quite remarkable. Indeed, if you compare the performance of this the system with other existing strategies, you see, I mean, uh, low power consumption strategies to be, let's say, uh, competitive. You see that only uh, pneumatic actuation can, let's say, raise high forces like osmotic. And pneumatic can be, let's say, more energy efficient, but we could be, let's say, more energy dense. So this is very nice, but maybe for us it was more interesting just to have this kind of representation here. So we are here overlaying our artificial device on this graph for natural system. If you put our device here, considering that it's typical end scale, it's 10 millimeters, we see that our time scale that's around, let's say 100 seconds, it's perfectly matching the one of an ideal giant plant cell at the same land scale. So this means that our device, besides being bi-inspired, was also biomimetic as for the actuation time. And this opened the possibility to use this device to investigate the natural system. So the natural plant osmolites, for which there are many still open issues still uh, today. And amongst them, let's say the support potassium chloride conundrum. So potassium chloride in the literature has been considered and still considered as the main player, I would say almost the only player for actuation. However, it doesn't let's say, provide a physiological environment for the cell. And more importantly, it's not efficiently retained within the cell. So if you consider the rejection of uh, potassium chloride by the cell, it's very high and it's very small compared to the pore size. So it's very costly uh, energy wise for the cell to retain potassium. Moreover, there are other molecules like glucose and glutamine within the plant cytosol and their effect must be elucidated. So leveraging our device, we consider, let's say, a plant, uh, two plant cytosol, one for generic plant cell and the other one for the motor cell, plus potassium chloride alone and derived mixture by changing the stoichiometry, that's the composition of these three components. And we use our, our device to make a kind of race in between this model uh, cytosol and we saw that Potassium chloride seems to be, let's say, the fastest, let's say, the, 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 the more energetic, the most energetic, the most explosive at the very beginning. But if you consider the process over the characteristic, let's say, time of actuation, and here you can see the advantage of having our device, you can see that this blue curve here, that's, let's say, the motor cell of the real plants outperform potassium chloride. And this can be explained in terms of the uh, cooperative effect between osmolites, which can decrease the vector of osmolite through the pressurized osmotic membrane. Also because, let's say, osmolites form this kind of complexes that were postulated and observed by nuclear magnetic resonance. So just to wrap up, we started from, let's say, a natural model that was, let's say, plant cell. And by a simple model, we derived a bi-inspired artificial system, our actuator. We could demonstrate some actuation and new applications, so new technology. By the way, uh, so far I just, let's say, showed to you kind of irreversible actuation. So whenever I load, the, the, let's say, with um, the salts by osmotic actuation chamber, it starts and I cannot stop based on what I've shown to, so, today so, so far to you. But nowadays, we can also demonstrate reversible actuation. Here, it's not in the slides because a, a new paper will, will be, let's say, published hopefully in a, in a few days. However, being biomimetic, we could also, let's say, look back to the bio biological system. So we could use our artificial device to study the biological model and, let's say, produce new understanding about the validate scientific hypothesis. So osmosis-based actuation provides a paradigm for both biorobotic science and biorobotics technology. And it's quite remarkable that everything started from a very simple model that, let's say, uh, permitted us to understand where to start from. So which was the right time scale, land scale, we should look at. The second, uh, the second, uh, okay, sorry.
I should remove these slides. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Uh, the second story regards uh, magnetic targeting and retrieval from the bloodstream. As maybe likely you know, uh, magnetic targeting is one, let's say, of the um, most promising strategy for targeted therapy nowadays. So the idea is quite simple. You should use, let's say, tiny particles, tiny carriers, magnetic response carriers that are not permanent magnets, but let's say can let's say, respond to, let's say, a magnetic field, developing a kind of magnetic dipole effects whenever they are exposed to a magnetic source that's a permanent magnet or, let's say, magnet or current. Uh, and the idea is to use external magnets or currents to accumulate that drug carriers at the target side in such a way to reduce the dose and reduce, let's say, the uh, toxicity that's induced by, let's say, systemic uh, injection. Moreover, you can also image the system by using uh, magnetic resonance imaging systems. So it's very nice because they can form simultaneously like diagnostic and uh, therapeutic agents, so theranostic in a sense. That's why many groups, many groups have been studying those systems for a while now. However, in the vast majority of the cases, they just consider small vessels like capillary flows, very tiny flow, and relatively close to the, to the source. So as you can see here, so I'm not blaming on any, anybody, but you, you can see that they play with magnets very close to this kind of ideal artificial vessels. And this distribution, in many cases, it's not necessarily consistent with clinical constraints. Uh, but if you want to release those agents, uh, either by standard injection or let's say by uh, state-of-the-art or future uh, intravascular devices, you have to, let's say, access larger vessels where you have larger flow rates, so dragging it will be really effective for that. And also, let's say, pulsatility plays a role. For this reason, we, uh, let's say, derived a solution for pulsatile flows in cylindrical vessels starting from the flow rate. Indeed, talking with medical doctors, we understood that they can only estimate the flow rate for instance, using MRI or let's say Doppler. And so here we were able to link the flow rate to the velocity passing through the, uh, the gradient of the pressure. And using this solution was, let's say, quite uh, interesting because here it's an analytical solution. It involves some, let's say, exotic functions like vessel function or hypergeometric function. Might seem exotic, but you can really easily compute all those functions by using the many car libraries. So this is an expensive from a computational point of view. And for this reason, we thought that we could use this solution to better understand and investigate targeting. For this reason, we also introduced some models for, let's say, uh, magnets. Here you can see model for an axial magnet with axial magnetization. Also, this can be written in analytical terms using some classical function. Here, it's, uh, they are called co complete elite intervals. You can really retrieve them from any libraries. And we use the whole models for the particles. So we could integrate the trajectory of the particles considering, let's say, the dragging by the, uh, the blood and, let's say, the attraction, the magnetic link caused by these external magnets. And we saw, let's say, that these Unsteady effect plays a clear role. For instance, the capture region, that's this green region here, it tends to be different from the one in the stationary ideal flowing capillaries. Moreover, for instance, you could, you could uh, get some particles which were released farther from the magnet, but you could miss some other particles which were released closer simply because it depends on the momentum, it's, let's say position speed, and of the particles, let's say, approaching the near field of the magnet. Moreover, if you consider the strong adverse scanning effect with the distance, so if, for instance, you have two sm small dipoles, you know that the force decreases like the reciprocal of the fourth power of the distance. So whenever you increase the distance in between the magnetic source and the particles, the force dramatically, let's say, reduces. And this, let's say, render very hard to efficiently capture in uh, clinically representative conditions these particles. So it's very challenging to control and track this kind of biodistribution. So you started from the problem of, let's say, potential harmful by distribution of drugs, and you thought that targeting could be, let's say, a solution. But if you consider, let's say, these, let's say, arguments, you may end up with a new problem that's, let's say, current by distribution could be a problem. So maybe there is, this is not the way to go. You should go for another path. And for this reason, for instance, we devised together with medical doctors another solution. So we considered some organs like liver, pancreas, lung, and kidney, very important because we have very high aggressive tumors therein. And we introduce a two catheter strategy. So we one catheter 
you bring the particles close to the target, and with the other cut, there are UA TL for particles that were not really, were not, let's say, uh, trapped, uh, attracted by the target side. Why? Because in these organs, you have, let's say, a main arterial inlet and a main venous outlet. So whenever you have some particles passing through here, the, let's say the retrieval venous catheter, if you manage to retrieve them, you are safe because those particles that were kept at the target, it's okay. For those that basically pass by here, whenever, let's say, you manage to retrieve most of them, you are safe because they will not, let's say, contribute to any uncontrolled bile distribution. For this mission, we started from the previous analytical model. We used, let's say, more refined numerical things up to devising this kind of tiny magnetic module where we have tiny magnets whose shape and position has been optimized for the particles to snake in between these gaps here. And it's not trivial because you want to reduce the gaps for the particles to be trapped, let's say, around the edges of these magnets. But whenever you squeeze the gap too much, you accelerate the flow because of mass conservation. And so you have to reach kind of this hybrid of anyhow. This was, let's say, model-based design, and it was integrated in a clinically used catheter here. This is a clinical catheter, so effectively used in the clinics. We predicted a very high capture efficiency, uh, almost 95% for larger particles, uh, almost 680, sorry, for smaller ones. And these predictions were nicely matched by, let's say, the experiments, and we didn't see any blood alteration. So this new procedure could really outperform current chemobolization procedure and also maybe open the way for more aggressive formulation. So to group up, we had kind of, let's say, uh, we started from targeting. So the, the academic tape was targeting. We introduced some models and this kind of theoretical models simplified, permitted us to understand that maybe this was not the way, the way to go. So we had to change take and try to tackle the problem from a completely different perspective. So we end up with particle retrieval and by using additional computational models, model-based design, we produce a new tool, a new procedure. And you may understand that we could iterate what they call, let's say, a converging development of models and tools that must be intertwined in my understanding. And it's very nice strategy-wise, but it's also very, let's say, nice for, as well, let's say, being timely, because last year, uh, there was this kind of very important statement uh, by the FDA, the commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, mentioned that virtual testing and computer models must be integrated into the, let's say, regulatory process because the use of in silico tools in clinical trials can improve drug development and make regulation more efficient. So it's very nice in this case that simple model could really steer you towards uh, some research path or let's say open new frontiers uh, where you might be, let's say, more effective or, let's say, uh, let's say, increase your potential for effective translation. And here we come to the last story. That's the crazy one, as I anticipated. And that's the story of the interlace continuum probe. And in the sense, I'm here, let's say, acknowledging Johann Sebastian Bach, because truly this was a kind of musical offering to flexible robotics. I hope that, let's say, our uh, human uh, listen, humanities listener may appreciate this. Even if also in this case, we started by talking with medical doctors. So here in this movie, you can see uh, a contactless navigation of, a, let's say, a kind of flexible tool within the brain ventricles. This was a dream, and admittedly, it's still a dream. But they dream of performing this kind of navigation without touching, scraping this very delicate tissue, because these ventricles are very delicate structure filled with a kind of water embedded in our brain parenchyma. And you want to reach this kind of, for instance, remote location here where you want not only to inspect, but also to perform some kind of biopsy or let's say any other action. And I mean, in principle, this seems to be, let's say, simply stated at least. So you must start from point A, you must reach, you must reach point B along a given trajectory with, by avoiding obstacles, having, let's say, the entire tool to be deployed along the this trajectory. So this is called the full leader deployment. Why? Because basically the tip, let's say being the leader and the, the, the whole shaft of the, of the tool is going to pass where the tip has already passed by. So that's why it's called follow the leader. By the way, this was an, an open challenge just let's say years ago for a flexible tool and you understand how potential this could be for many applications. For instance, for contactless inspection at large, also for remote system where you can access or you don't want to disassemble for instance but also for medical robotics. So either as a tool, if you are, let's say, managed to really miniaturize the system or let's say as a tool guide. And 
Well, which was the first move? Well, it was clear to me at the very beginning that for a flexible tool, this was beyond the reach of a single tool. So we need at least a couple of tools. And the idea was to have two mutually supporting tools. I started from symmetry and I only considered symmetry for the entire development. So then this, this baby, it's just, let's say, base was born based on just an abstraction. However, you may wonder why I inserted this picture here. Because just at the end, when the problem was solved, I found this picture and maybe they can illustrate, they can provide that kind of exposed analogy of what could two mutually supporting tools might be. So here you can see, for instance, hand bridges. And here hands can really manage to, let's say, build in space this kind of large structure that's uh, having characteristic size sensibly larger than the, the body size by stiffening, uh, which is achieved by limbs interlocking. So, Mutually supporting tools, let's say, for me was, let's say, something uh, similar, but how to, let's say, locate these tools? So one within the other, so this could be an option. However, for flexible systems, it's not, let's say, very, very um, simple because this really introduced a symmetry breaking quite strong at the very beginning. So one close to each other, for instance, this is called interlocked. Might be interesting, so this might, might work for this kind of deformation that you are seeing now. In this case, they are really not affected by each other, but whenever you try to, let's say, go in the other direction, one tool will, would impede or, let's say, uh, being favored by the other, and this is breaking symmetry. So ideally, you should come and merge two tools here, it's the green one and the blue one. Uh, how? In such a way to, let's say, achieve a kind of, let's say, compound tool that behaves in pretty much as, let's say, each single component would have done without, let's say, uh, with, by respecting, let's say, the, the, the constraints of each component. And this configuration that interlaced was without any prior art, not even concept, not patent, nothing. So we have this vision of a couple of uh, flexible tools, one sliding along the other, and the fixed tool, it's stiff, the moving tool, it's floppy, and they alternatively stiffen and get floppy, so that basically one supports the deployment of the other. You can see there's a leader, there's a forward, and however, whenever you retract, as you can see here, they switch the role. So basically, there is no leader and no follower. That's basically each tool should be a, like a leader and a follower. And this, in, let's say, put, let's say, the degree of symmetry to a higher level. And, but how to make a leader and a follower identical? And I was listening to Bach's musical offering when I, it was really very clear to my mind. Come on, it's a canon. So let me just remind you that in music, a canon is a counterpoint-based composition uh, that employs a melody with one or more imitation of the melody itself that played after a given duration. So in this example here, that maybe the, the simplest one, it's a Frederick Schrag canon. We have the first melody here that's, uh, it's called in music, the Dux in Latin or leader in English. And the indication of the, this melody, they're called commas in Latin or followers in English. So also the nomenclature was strikingly the same. And here you can see that the follower in this case, it's identical to the leader. It simply starts to bar up to the leader. And here you have another, let's say, follower here, but let's just focus on these two. So the structure of the leader is such that whenever it is played simultaneously with a copy of itself just delayed, it respects the constraints of harmony. So there's some intelligence that it's coded, of course, within this melody that makes this possible. If you want to abstract a little bit, you have, let's say, your leader that it's composed with the follower. And here in music, composition means that it's simultaneously played with the, with the follower. And the follower, it's just a time translation, in this simplest case of the leader. And this basically sounds pleasantly, meaning that it respects the constraints by provided by harmony. So having this in mind, it became, be, became clear to me how this could be translated into flexible robotics. So I have a leader that's a flexible tool. And here a composition means that uh, each flexible tool is deployed along the other. And the follower cannot be in this case, in this case, a time translation of the leader, but it's a space translation. In particular, it's an angular shift of the leader. And whenever you compose the follower and the leader, you build the track, meaning that you respect the constraints that it, they are posed by the simultaneous presence in space of both tools. So this was the move. The music was really the, let's say, the inspiration to, to, the, to, to give a body to this concept. However, when you work on the symmetry, you, you see that this is quite a crazy tool because 
whenever the reader has to span the follower or vice versa, it must have, let's say, free space. So these two, uh, provided that it exists, must be almost empty. So this device should be an empty device. And if you think of having, let's say, a push-pull system with roads, uh, you need at least three roads to steer space. You have two systems, so you have six roads, and by symmetry, they must be placed at the vertices of an hexagon. So these disks, where everything should occur, that's, let's say, basically, you must stiffen or, let's say, make your tool floppy with something happening within this disk here, yeah, they should respect this kind of hexagonal symmetry. And here is, let's say, the core of the stuff. So I introduced a model, a simple model, that ideally splits the deployment of the leader from the one of the follower. And here the idea is that whenever the leader <coughs> achieves, let's say, a circular shape with a given curvature, K here, the action on these disks uh, corresponds to pure torque regardless of the length of the span, this parameter L here. However, if this length is, let's say, too long over a given threshold, this becomes very compliant. So whenever the follower catches up, the leader wouldn't be able to keep this pose and will distort and produce this kind of instabilities. If you want, let's say, formally speaking, this corresponds to a set of, let's say, ordinary differential equations, simple because time is not an issue here. And I use Cosra models for the roads, um, local elastic kick of road constitutive equations, and just, let's say, linear and angular uh, momentum equilibrium plus some constraints due to the uh, geometrical, let's say, this location of the, the constraints on the proximal and distal disk. So the idea is just to mention that this formulation can be simple by symmetry in this case, but that this can be, let's say, extended and it's quite general. And I wanted just to, let's say, mention that this simple model permitted, let's say, to predict this kind of instabilities very accurately. So we were able to give, let's say, to fix the span of the, our device, given the diameter, to achieve a given trajectory and curvature. And so we could, for instance, refine the design, for instance, uh, how can I freeze the shape? I can freeze the shape by giving voltage to these tiny bricks here. So this is piezoelectric material. Whenever this elongates, they form this kind of cage, which increases the friction on the passing through roads. And it's not trivial to design this because, I mean, I, this elongates a few microns, and I need more than 15 newtons here in this direction using the model. So this is quite complex, and this is the solution after many design and space, uh, sorry, shape optimization iteration here. And here you can see the assembly of this disk here. Uh, also the distal disk, the one without, let's say, this piezo brick are, let's say, very simple. And here I wanted just to mention that this couple of tools must be assembled one within each other. So uh, in general, this is not possible. But in this case, symmetry permits it to, uh, let's say, assemble this, this tool in this way. And uh, more interestingly, symmetry also permitted to build the entire probe by only using five different components. So one, two, three, four, and five. With these five components, I can build the entire system. So still thanks to, to symmetry. And here you can see, let's say, the prototype. We also consider the force that you need to push pull the system and the stiffness. And here is the, let's say, the final slide on this system where we are seeing the deployment of the full of the leader uh, continuum probe, we had six roads. These roads are the vertices of an hexagon. Here we are looking at the scene by one side, so two couple of roads should be coinciding. This means that you should only see four roads. You see four roads. Whenever the system comes to a, let's say, a stop, I'm just flipping the voltage in such a way that uh, one tool gets floppy and the, one, the other one gets stiff. And you shouldn't see any distortion of the pose. And indeed, you don't see any distortion. Moreover, if things were done correctly, you should systematically see four roads, meaning that basically this is very accurately deployed in space by building the track. So what we are seeing here, it's a tool that sits growing by physically building its track without any support in free space. And this was at the first instance of, let's say, a flexible tool able to follow the leader. And I think so far it's still the only, let's say, flexible device instance of this kind of uh, capability. We were able to achieve very, very, let's say, nice curvature on a single plane. Whenever uh, we try to, let's say, uh, pursue a double curvature shape, I must admit that it's more challenging because of the finite width of the disk and also because whenever you want to flip the curvature, so being let's say, first in this plane and then in this direction here, uh, you directly oppose the previous, let's say, actions. So yeah. on, a, on a system that is, let's say, even longer, so you have some more challenges. Yeah.
let's say more details and here I leave some let's say references for the curious ones and I just let's say conclude by uh, using two slides where uh, I was pleased to record some let's say sentences that Fabio was really using in other lectures so Shanghai lectures I mean given a behavior of interest how does it come about how to implement it and I think that the modeling could be, let's say, very helpful in answering these points, as we have seen for, let's say, the first story, the one on natural systems, but also, let's say, for artificial systems. And of course, things can be seen differently. And here we have seen how, let's say, for instance, symmetry allowed to, let's say, simplify our approach, change, and let's say, innovate in a sense. So here, simplicity, it's not, let's say, being trivial, it's, let's say, kind of result of, let's say, being very uh, refined in a sense. And of course, we have seen that the opportunity to connect, for instance, natural devices with artificial systems up to, let's say, closing the loop, as we have seen in the first story, but also through the second one. And of course, embodied intelligence is something that is ex extremely relevant to this approach. So we have seen how models can help, help us, let's say, understand and unveil the embodied intelligence in natural systems and help us, let's say, code mechanical intelligence, let's say, in our devices, embodied our let's say, intelligence in the device we want to create. And we have seen how it's important to, let's say, co-develop models and tools. And that's what's clear, let's say, for the third and the second story. And here I can truly see that basically, uh, oops. I should ask, stop my video. No, go. Okay, I, sh I, I can see the generalization based, let's say, on AI techniques where this kind of evolutionary design can be refined by using, let's say, AI methods, for instance, to account for larger variability, patient-specific uh, parameter space, and so on. And last but not least, we have seen how it's necessary just to bridge across disciplines. So it's a truly multidisciplinary approach. And here I just please to recall this, uh, let's say, motto from uh, a Latin poet. Uh, saying nemo solus satis sapit means that no one, let's see, no one alone, it's sufficiently wise on itself. So we really need to bridge uh, amongst our community and let's see our uh, background. And I think that the Shanghai Lecture truly provide a remarkable, outstanding platform for that. So I really appreciated your attention. Thank you very much for this. So thank you, um, Eduardo, for this. Uh, Great lecture. I think that uh, for uh, um, for uh, um, some of you, this has been a, a buff uh, in engineering stuff. Uh, I think it, it's very interesting. I think uh, probably uh, people, uh, students in engineering, will be particularly grateful to see the real stuff. And uh, I also think that uh, think that you should uh, um, always consider that uh, we we actually uh, keep uh, a, a functional, uh, if you wish, uh, high level approach. Uh, but then, depending uh, of your uh, area of of investigation and research, uh, you will go deeper on on, the, on certain aspects uh, or other aspects. Um, uh, now I would like to know if there are uh, any questions from the audience. Uh, in, in any case, uh, um, uh, Eduardo, like every speaker, can be reached uh, uh, through me or, or directly and I uh, will be happy to answer to, to any question that you, uh, that you may have. Thank you. So it seems that there are no, no questions. So I understand that it was uh, actually a lot of, or a lot of stuff. I understand that uh, it, uh, it, it has been a lot of stuff. So uh, take your time.
and uh, think about the questions uh, and uh, I will be happy to forward uh, uh, to uh, Eduardo. So you have seen uh, uh, what uh, we, what we mean, what actually uh, bio inspira inspiration might mean. It's not less models or less mathematics from the engineer or uh, scientist point of view. It's probably more weird uh, and more sophisticated uh, approaches, uh, but still uh, you have a lot of math uh, and still uh, you have a lot of, um, of effort, of intellectual effort to develop models that it is needed. So thank you, uh, Eduardo. Um, thank, you, thank you everybody for, um, for attending so far. Now we, um, in a few minutes, actually in three minutes, uh, we will uh, we will give a floor to Josh Bongard from the University of of, of, uh, of Vermont. Welcome, Josh. Uh, who will talk um, about uh, actually evolutionary design and uh, coevolution and both of body. Uh, control uh, and intelligence. So a, a very, I would say, a, a very core topic uh, on uh, of, uh, in, for these lectures. Also, you know that Josh, together with uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, is one of the two authors of our textbook, How the Body Shapes the, the Way We Think. Um, so uh, I think that uh, I can give uh, the, the floor to, to Josh. So, Josh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, th thank you very much, Fabio, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for having me. It's always uh, an exciting uh, experience to be uh, uh, invited to the Shanghai Lectures and also a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I'm here in uh, Vermont in the United States, and it's currently uh, 4.20 a.m., so... Uh, an early start on the day for me, but uh, but happy to have you. to discuss with all of you about uh, evolutionary robotics. So, shall I start uh, uh, sharing my screen now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see uh, my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, I think we'll leave things like that. Okay, so um, what I, um, oh, and before I get started, Fabio, could you give me an idea about how long I have for my presentation? Uh, you are 40 minutes. 40 minutes. So until uh, 11, and until 5 a.m. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Uh, so, so as Fabio mentioned, uh, my primary uh, research area is evolutionary robotics, and I'll tell you a little bit about what evolutionary robotics is. Um, in the first part of my, my lecture, and then in the second part, I'll explain how we use this particular approach to understanding intelligence to help us study embodied cognition. Um, as Fabio mentioned uh, a number of years back, I had the honor of, of co-authoring uh, a textbook with Rolf Pfeiffer on exactly this topic of embodied cognition and how the body shapes the way we think, and I, I, I understand that you've uh, made some progress on that topic, and I hope to shed some light on that topic from a different direction, from the direction of evolution and robotics. Um, before I get started on the topic, as I mentioned, I'm uh, presenting this morning from Vermont. I'm a faculty member here uh, at the University of Vermont, uh, which is tucked up in the northeast corner here of the U United States, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with this part of the world. Um, and I'm also a faculty member here at the University of Vermont of the Complex Systems Center. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary group of eight faculty for mathematics, engineering, computer science, biology and neuroscience. Um, and if you are interested in studying uh, in the United States, uh, just yesterday uh, we announced uh, a new PhD program in complex systems. We have seven PhD and masters uh, fully funded fellowships available. Um, if you're interested in some of the topics you've heard about in this course or hopefully evolutionary robotics, which I'll tell you about today, uh, we'd love to receive an application from you. So um, to, to situate the study of evolutionary robotics, I, I like to sort of uh, describe the landscape of robotics and AI as it currently stands. Um, in the history of AI, which has been running for about 75 years now, uh, for many of those decades, there was 
limited progress in our ability to make intelligent machines. But as we all know, thanks to the data revolution and the deep learning revolution, we are now able to produce machines that are able to perform some tasks, which we consider intelligent uh, better than humans do. And so if you think about um, the, the, the vector that I have at the bottom here, you could imagine any point along this vector as representing a machine and its horizontal position on this vector is its ability to perform the task that it's been given. Um, and that task is usually at the moment in deep learning, uh, finding patterns in data. If you then think about an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that trains a machine to become more accurate at a task, you can imagine that algorithm as a sub vector lying along this vector. It's a, an arrow that pushes one point, a low performing machine along this vector to another machine, which is a higher performing machine. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh, excuse me, maybe you could put the presentation full screen. I can I can do that. Um, on my screen, it cuts off a little bit of the right hand side of the slide. Uh, as you prefer. No, no, as you prefer. I thought it okay, was. Okay, I think I'll, I'll leave it like this, and if there's anything that's occluded, I'll I'll switch out of this mode. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Sorry yeah, no problem. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna use uh, I'm gonna try and sort of describe the landscape of of artificial intelligence using this geometric interpretation. So this one, this one dimension that we have at the moment is accuracy or ability of a machine to perform the task. We can then add a second dimension um, and you can think of this second dimension as a series of tasks. And in this cartoon representation here, I've ordered the tasks from the bottom towards the top as tasks that are easier or harder for current state of the art machines to solve. Um, we were able to create machines to play uh, a good game of checkers in the 1980s. It took a decade for us to, to create machines that could master a game of chess. And then it took a further 20 years until just recently, until we had machines that could play a good game of Go. Um, computer vision is now on the way to being a solved problem. Um, natural language processing, for a number of reasons, has turned out to be more difficult than the four tasks below it. Uh, and so on. So uh, you can now imagine each of these green vectors here as, again, our ability to create machines that do well at these tasks. And for NLP, natural language processing, uh, not so well. Um, you, can then, um, you can then think about uh, how do we create machines that are generally intelligent? For most people working in robotics and AI, this is this is the, this is the actual goal is to try and create machines. Uh, okay, uh, to try and create machines that are able to not only learn a given task but gradually acquire the ability to perform more and more tasks. Um, so now, algorithms that try and expose machines to an increasing number of tasks, you can think of as a vector that lies along some diagonal. Um, you may or may not believe that AGI is uh, possible, but the, the research paradigm really in AI and robotics is how far up and to the right can we push in this two-dimensional plane. It turns out, um, as we've learned throughout the history of AI, that moving upward in this plane is more difficult than moving to the right, because moving up requires a machine that's already able to perform one task to acquire the ability to perform a new task without forgetting how to perform the original task. This is known as catastrophic forgetting in the machine learning literature and is a notoriously difficult uh, problem. However, there is also a third dimension, which is this uh, dimension of embodiment. And it's very difficult to actually boil embodiment down to a single number that we could represent as a third vector in this uh, space. So I've just put some little cartoons here where uh, machines that have little to no embodiment are our traditional laptops and desktops. Um, a little bit further along or a little bit more embodied is the, the Roomba. Um, this is limited in terms of the embodiment and it's limited in the sense that it's limited in the number of ways in which it can impact its environment. The Roomba can move forward, back, turn left and turn right. Um, and that's about it. Um, and uh, you can see at the uh, end of this, 
at the at the back of this cube, I've put the Atlas robot, a humanoid robot, which has a large number of motors, a large number of sensors, and a large number of ways in which it can push against the world and observe uh, how the world pushes back. So now we have a three-dimensional volume where any point in this volume still represents a machine and the XYZ coordinate of that machine represents how well it is at performing a task, the number of tasks it can perform, which is at the height of the point, and how close towards the back of the cube this point is, the Z coordinate is how embodied it is. And again, any vector moving through this three-dimensional space is an algorithm that is trying to train a machine to become more performant or better at the tasks and possibly more embodied. So now uh, you can imagine, uh, now you can imagine uh, a, a vector moving along the grand diagonal of this space where uh, the, the, this grand diagonal now is a machine learning algorithm that is trying to improve the machine's performance, the number of tasks it can perform, but also increasing its uh, embodiment at the same time. And now on the vertical axis here, the number of tasks, I've sort of grayed out the ones that we are able to perform at the bottom. Uh, in black here, the ones that are still areas of, of very intense research. And NLP is sort of at the top here, still an open problem uh, in AI. So um, these are two different approaches to trying to create generally intelligent machines. And it's an open question about whether we will be able to, to move closer to AGI with non-embodied machines, like a, a deep learner that has no body with which to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Or are we going to, or is it going to be some embodied machine that is ultimately able to exhibit uh, artificially artificially intelligent, uh, general intelligence. Okay, so um, let's have a look at some, some state of the art work in the field. Um, this is some work uh, from uh, Google uh, just reported this past summer. Uh, this was a project about scalable deep reinforcement learning for robot manipulation. Um, as you can see, the tweet sort of summarizes the method here. Uh, there are seven uh, robot arms tasked with performing object manipulation. Uh, the arms are equipped with a, a very deep uh, neural network. The initial, uh, the initial values of the weights in this network were set by hand. Um, the seven robots then performed over four months, 580,000 attempts to grab objects in the bins in front of them. Uh, it took four months to do so. Each robot was equipped with a red, green, blue uh, camera input. The network itself had 1.2 million uh, parameters. And after four months, they exposed these seven arms to objects that the, the arms had not seen before and were able to grasp the objects 96% uh, of the time. So an incredibly impressive uh, robotics experiment and definitely a lot of progress on state of, state of the art here. However, if you take the, the, uh, the machine here and the algorithm that produced the successful behavior, you can think of this as a vector that moves horizontally within a particular plane in this uh, cube. So we have machines on the left, which aren't able to grasp unknown objects. And then this machine learning algorithm moves within a horizontal plane. The morphology of these robots do not change over, their, over these four months. It's the same machine, seven machines. Uh, and eventually become increasingly good at performing uh, object manipulation. Okay, if you think about all the machine learning uh, and robotics experiments you've read about in the literature, I will bet that most of them have this form. They assume a fixed morphology, if there is a morphology, and then they use some kind of machine learning algorithm to train a network or some sort of control policy for that fixed morphology robot. In my group, we try and in, in most of the work that we do in my group, we relax the assumption that the body of the, of the machine stays fixed over the length of the experiment. So again, just to show the difference here in my own work, which I'm gonna show you now, we assume that the embodiment of the robots change 
over the length of an experiment. And when you start to think about robots that change their body, it changes the kinds of research questions you can ask and hopefully opens up new pathways to push towards the top right back of this cube, push towards intelligent and general and robust machines. I'll show you uh, one, one experiment uh, that we performed a number of years back uh, now that received some considerable uh, attention. This was the Resilient Machines Project. The way this works is that we have a, a physical machine down here. This is a quadrupedal robot. And uh, maybe I will be able to zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit better. I think that's better. Okay, we have a, a physical robot down here, a quadrupedal robot, and uh, as this robot behaves, it generates sensor motor data, and that sensor motor data is gonna be fed back into a physical simulation, and the robot is going to try and generate different body plans. You can see one body plan here, which is actually incorrect. This is not how the physical robot is put together and it's going to use that sensor motor data to try and train, a machine learning algorithm is gonna train a body to reflect reality. So what you're watching here is the robot, the physical robot acting, and as it's doing that, it's dreaming, it's coming up, and, uh, it's coming up with an understanding of self, and once it has an understanding of self, which you'll see here in a moment, it's able to use that sense of self to train a way of moving before attempting that movement in reality. So we have a physical robot that can go back and forth between actions in reality and internally, uh, in, internally rehearsing actions before trying them out in reality. And so in this case, the physical robot's body does not change but clearly its conception of itself does change. So we have some form of morphological change in this experiment. In the second phase of this experiment, there is actually, uh, there is morphological change. If you look at the physical robot, um, it undergoes physical damage. So in this case, we mechanically separated the lower part of the robot's leg. The robot doesn't have a camera. It doesn't have pain receptors. It can't see or sense the fact that this damage has occurred, but it can sense with its other sensors that something has changed. So it takes its current conception of itself, which is that it's made up, that it's a four-legged robot, and it uses this new sensor motor data that's coming from the damaged uh, robot to update this self model, which you'll see it do here in a moment. This is the machine learning algorithm trying out one uh, self model after the other, uh, and it eventually converges on the correct description, which is that it's a three and a half legged machine now, not a four legged machine. So now using this process, it's diagnosed what the damage is. It can then use, uh, it can then using this virtual model, retrain a new way of moving that works or compensates for the damage. And if we're lucky, uh, it's able to compensate for this damage and continue its mode of operation. So in this case, we have morphological change that was not under the robot's control. Something changed to the body and it had to adapt to that, that change. Okay, that was some early work in this, this area. I'm gonna show you a, a, very, a completely different research project now. This one has to do with language. As I mentioned, this one is sort of an uh, NLP, is an open research problem uh, in the field. And it turns out that there is an embodied approach to enabling machines to understand and generate language. And this is uh, known as the symbol grounding problem or actually solving the symbol grounding problem. So um, what is the symbol grounding problem? The symbol grounding problem is that if we have a bunch of symbols, for example, words in natural language, uh, it's hard for a machine to ground those symbols because one symbol is usually defined as a series of other symbols. If I was to ask you for the definition of the, of the symbol jump, uh, if you were to answer me in English, you would give me back a series of English sim symbols, which to a robot are as equally unintelligible as the symbol J-U-M-P. This has been, a, again, a problem in, in AI for a long, for a long time. Um, and a number of people working in embodied cognition proposed 
a way to solve this using embodiment. And here's, here's an idea of how this solution goes. Imagine we have a, a robot that has pressure sensors in the soles of its feet. Um, and this robot, uh, as it goes about its task, it moves around and from every once in a while, um, suddenly it feels all the pressure on the soles of its feet drop to zero because whatever it was doing caused it to jump. The robot does not know what jump means, but human trainers, whenever human trainers observe the robot leaving the ground, they issue the symbol J-U-M-P. So a robot that's paying attention will learn that there's a correlation in time between a physical experience, uh, pressure sensors dropping to zero, and the appearance of the symbol J-U-M-P. Over time with the machine learning algorithm, this robot if supplied with the symbol J-U-M-P and asked to explain what J-U-M-P means, the robot will jump. It will demonstrate that it understands that symbol by actually jumping. Jumping, however, is what's known as a very motoric word. It's a, it's a verb. You can understand how jump is related to actions. Um, in language, however, there are a number of other symbols or other words that are much more abstract, like movement, political movement, and socialism. The solution to the symbol grounding problem says that if a robot can ground very motoric words, like jump, um, move, turn left, turn right, and so on, using the same principle, it should be able to then recursively uh, ground slightly more abstract words in the more uh, in the more motoric words so a robot that learns jump and uh, move and turn left and turn right and crawl will learn that in all those cases it also hears the symbol m-o-v-e-m-e-n-t and such a hypothetical robot could gradually learn that this particular symbol is a container word for all the other ones. So jump is a type of movement. So now we have a robot that's not just learning symbols, but starting to learn a semantic network where nodes in the network are words and relationships between them are, uh, and arrows between them are uh, the semantics, the semantic relationships between them. In theory, you could recursively continue this and maybe uh, eventually you could have a robot that is able to ground a word like socialism or democracy, uh, which are very abstract words. However, uh, if you think about even those very abstract words, they, they also have a motoric component, which might seem strange. If you think about the word democracy, one way of visualizing that as an action is to imagine playing the game tug of war. Um, which in, in the Western world is a game where you have a very thick rope, a very long and thick rope. You have five people on one side pulling on the rope and five people on the other side pulling the rope. And whichever team is stronger will pull the rope to their side. So maybe even abstract words like socialism and democracy could be directly grounded in physical experience. Anyways, that's the solution to the symbol grounding problem. But as you can tell from this cartoon, this is sort of just a, a hypothesis, an idea. How could you do this in reality? So recently, uh, recently we introduced um, a paper um, that reports on the Twitch Plays Robotics Project. And what I'm showing you in this video is a snapshot from our website. And you can go and try it yourself. It's running live right now. Um, it's called Twitch Plays Robotics. When you go to the Twitch Plays Robotics website, this is what you'll see. You'll see a robot that is moving around. This robot does not understand symbols. However, uh, in the chat window on the right, um, users can type commands that they would like to teach these machines. So we tell people arriving at the website to think of these robots as pets or animals. They are probably able to learn some commands, but there's a vast number of commands that they probably cannot learn. In the top right here, you'll see that um, people are voting for what command to teach the robots next. At the moment, the crowd would like to try and teach the robots walk forward next. There's five votes to teach that, one to teach spin, uh, and so on. In the bottom right down here, this explains that the current robot here, the blue robot, is hearing the term W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D. That's what the robot hears. 
if you as the human trainer believe that the robot actually is walking forward, you would type blue yes. If you think the robot is not walking forward, you would type BN. So the crowd is performing, is providing reinforcement for this particular robot under this particular command. That's the idea. Uh, we have this running, as I mentioned, uh, continuously, and we've had tens of thousands of robots that have been issued thousands of commands by tens of thousands of users, and we have several million pieces of reinforcement at the moment. So we have this growing data set, which the machines can then use to try and ground some of these uh, commands. And I'll show you just a little bit of this data set and how this process works. This is um, one particular robot. You can see here, it's a very simple one. It's made up of just three pieces and it's, it's attached by two rotational joints here. So a, very, a robot with a very simple body, a limited uh, embodiment. And this robot uh, was issued the command jump uh, several hundred times and each point in the graph here corresponds to one time that the robot uh, was issued the command jump. So as you might have seen in the video, the robot is always performing different actions. So we run different neural network controllers on the same morphology and we have different morphology. So for every morphology, we have many different controllers. In the case of our worm bot here, here are the, the several hundred controllers that actuated the robot when it heard the command jump. Okay, um, the horizontal position of a point corresponds to the proportion of time that the robot spent on the ground. So this robot has touch sensors and it's simply the fraction of time in which a touch sensor was firing. Points further to the right, more touch act act activation. Points to the left, less touch actuation. The vertical axis here or the, the height of a point corresponds to the amount of positive reinforcement received from the crowd for that controller under that command. So the points that you see up here uh, at the top, these all received unanimous yes votes or up votes from the crowd. Everyone who saw the robot using that controller under the command jump said yes, the robot is actually jumping. All of the controllers that you see down here, the, the crowd unanimously provided negative reinforcement. No, the robot is not jumping. And points in the middle here, there was disagreement among the crowd. Some said, yes, it's kind of jumping. Others said, no, that's just kind of twitching. It's not really getting off the ground. Some sort of disagreement. So that's the data set. Um, the first thing you could do is just simply perform linear regression on this data and you get the dotted regression line that you see here. Um, as you can see, the, the data is pretty uh, scattered, so it's not a very uh, clear um, correlation, but there is definitely an anti-correlation between positive reinforcement and proportion of time on the ground. So if you were to ask this robot what jump means, it would give you back this dotted line. The robot would tell you that um, what jump really means is spending as little time on the ground as possible, according to the crowd. So this is a way to solve the symbol grounding problem using embodiment, but also using uh, the crowd. So we actually, the robot is actually learning a three-way correlation here between, uh, between morphology, uh, sorry, between language, the symbols themselves, social reinforcement, what does the crowd think about what I do when I hear that command, and, and action, what, it, what the robot actually does. So that's that robot. In the same, uh, in the same experiment, we use the slightly more embodied uh, four-legged robot here, which has slightly more mechanical degrees of freedom. This robot was also issued the command jump uh, by the crowd uh, multiple times. And in this case, this particular robot obtained this data set and we got this anti-correlation in this case. And I'm gonna just flip back and forth between these two plots for a moment. And you'll notice that uh, the robots have learned the same thing. They've learned that there's an anti-correlation between social response and time spent on the ground but the y-intercept 
for these two uh, slopes is different. So what that means is that both robots have successfully grounded the symbol J-U-M-P, but jump means something slightly different to these robots due to their morphology. They feel slightly different things, and so jump means something slightly different. So that's an interesting twist to the symbol grounding problem that has not really been considered before, which is that understanding language is not only, not only requires a body, but the kind of body you have influences the way you understand the symbols of language, which is both an interesting finding and a worrying finding because as we build machines, even if we build very complex humanoid robots, those morphologies are going to be significantly different from human body plans. And thus, they may not be able to ground symbols in quite the same way that we do. We may understand jump as mentally imagining the experience of jumping, but that feels different to us than what it might feel to a robot. So can, uh, not only can robots ground symbols, but can we get them to ground symbols similarly to humans? So we now, we're now continuing the Twitch Plays Robotics experiment in which we're training these robots not just to ground symbols, but to try and ground them in the same way that humans do. As robots ground language and start to produce semantic networks like the ones you see in the cartoon here, we can match that against semantic networks that are being derived from human experience. One example of that is the word to VEC data set, if you're familiar with that. Um, that's a way of using deep learning to train uh, word to VEC vectors or lear learn a vector space, which represents relationships between words. And you can quantify the, um, you can quantify the proximity or how close two words are according to word to VEC. And you can then ask the robots how close are two words according to the robots and then ask what is the difference between those two metric spaces and that gives you a measurement of how closely the robots are grounding language compared uh, to humans. Kind of an interesting approach to this problem. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an ongoing experiment. Uh, please do come to twitch.tv slash twitchplaysrobotics and help teach our robots and help them uh, ground uh, language. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, switch now and again talk about a different project here. Um, uh, this, this last one is, uh, has to do with soft robotics, um, and this is uh, an, an emerging field in robotics, a very hot topic at the moment. Um, and I'll just, I guess, jump ahead and show you a picture here. Um, soft robots are kind of interesting because in a soft robot, it is much easier for the machine to change its morphology than it is for a traditional rigid machine to do so that's made up of a bunch of rigid links. So as soft robots become more and more uh, manufacturable and more and more research labs start working on soft robots, we're hoping that people embrace this idea of considering morphological change um, during an experiment and how that changes the kinds of research questions we ask about intelligent machines. Before I get to the soft robots, however, just a little bit of a philosophical digression here. Um, uh, there was a very famous uh, ethologist or a researcher of animal behavior, uh, Nicholas Tinbergen. Um, and one of the interesting uh, approaches to behavior that Tinbergen made clear is that when we try and describe a given behavior, um, we can describe that behavior from many different points of view. And those different points of view fall into two categories, proximate and ultimate. If you take a given behavior, for example, legged locomotion, you can ask proximate questions about legged locomotion. How does legged locomotion work? So uh, we might look at animal legs and, and human legs and try and understand musculature and the neural control of leg movement and balance and orientation. And we're asking proximate questions, things that are very close to the behavior itself. Alternatively, for exactly the same behavior, we can also ask uh, we can also ask ultimate questions about the same behavior. We can ask why questions. So, why did legged locomotion evolve in the first place? 
And the moment we ask ultimate questions, we are already implicitly thinking about morphological change, because obviously we have to think about uh, animals that weren't capable of legged locomotion or did not have legs, and then gradually evolved legs and legged uh, locomotion. So you can think about proximate questions as the how questions, how does the behavior work? And ultimate questions as why did that behavior evolve in the first place? So um, again, here's a simulation now of one of our soft, uh, one of our soft robots. This is a soft robot performing uh, legged locomotion, as you see here. Um, and we, again, we can try and understand how this particular robot exhibits this particular gait uh, and so on. But what's a little more interesting, I think, is to ask the why questions. Why do particular legged uh, locomotion strategies evolve in the first place? And if we take a robot and we ask the robot not to locomote, but instead to just move as quickly as possible, sometimes legged locomotion evolves and sometimes other forms of locomotion evolve, especially when we're dealing with soft robots. You can imagine a soft robot that's able to change its shape. Maybe it turns into a long one-dimensional structure and moves with angular-form locomotion or, or swimming or snake-like locomotion. Maybe we have a robot that stays flat and grows horizontal legs and moves like reptiles do. Maybe the robot grows vertical legs and moves like mammals do. Or maybe something else emerges, maybe something that we didn't even expect to emerge. So what I'm going to show you in this next video, this blue robot here, this is exactly what we did. Instead of taking the proximate view and asking how does legged locomotion work? Take what we know about legged locomotion and build that into a machine. Instead, we ask the question, why does legged locomotion evolve? Under what conditions will legged locomotion evolve? We just ask the robot to move from the left to the right side of the screen. We then used an evolutionary algorithm that tried out lots of different bodies and brains on the same robot, and we wanted to see what we would get. Um, as I mentioned, I work in the field of evolutionary robotics. So like in evolution, we're always working with a population of robots, not just a single robot. In all of the videos I've been showing you this morning, we've been looking at just one robot at a time, but these are robots that are pulled out of a population of robots. So in the, the robot I'm gonna show you at the moment, this was pulled out of an evolving population of robots. Each robot in that population had a different body and a different neural controller, but all of them were trying to perform the same task, move as quickly as possible. We evaluate each robot in this population, one after the other in the simulation. We measure the speed of each robot and that speed becomes the fitness. Robots that move more slowly are deleted from the population. And robots that survived are by definition those that move a little bit faster. We take all of those survivors, we make a copy of the body and brain of that robot, and when we make that copy, we introduce a slight random mutation. So each child is slightly different from the parent, and it might be morphologically different, it might look different, and it might also move differently. We take that child robot and we place it in an empty slot where we recently killed off one of the slower moving robots. We keep performing uh, reproduction and mutation and crossover until we replace all of the robots we deleted. We now have a full, a full population again, and we evaluate the new robots we just produced. And because uh, we introduced random change, most of those random changes broke the control policy that worked in the parent. So they, those new robots obtain very low fitness and are deleted, but every once in a while, those mutated new robots perform slightly better than anything else seen in the population up until that, that point. We repeat that process over and over again. It's a relatively simple algorithm, if you think about it, and evolutionary algorithms have been around since the 1960s. We're applying them now to sort of state-of-the-art uh, soft robotic technologies, but the, the underlying evolutionary algorithm is more or less the same. What's interesting is that when we allow uh, is that when we allow evolution to all, to tinker with 
the body and the brain simultaneously, we often get surprising results. As you can see here, this robot looks like a four-legged robot that's flipped onto its back. It turns out that's not quite the case. So this robot actually does exhibit legged locomotion, but it does so um, by growing legs whenever it needs them. So this one is able to grow legs and then use them for legged locomotion. If it tips over, it ingests or pulls that material back into itself and extrudes legs on the other side. Um, clearly this is a simulation and, isn't, uh, and is not uh, a hardware reality yet. Um, however, uh, here in the US, we have a funded project with uh, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio. Uh, Professor Kramer Botiglio is a mechanical engineer at Yale University. Um, she creates what, what are known as robot skins. So these are two dimensional skins and uh, Rebecca's group are able to stitch motors and sensors into the skin. And then you can then take that skin and wrap it around a passive deformable material like foam uh, or clay. And when you do, you roboticize that material. Um, you basically turn that material into a robot. Once you've wrapped that material in skin, now you have actuators on the surface and that those actuators, when they compress, they can constrict or compress clay or air or other compressible materials. And if you do it in the right way, you can compress material and extrude material at another place. It causes another part of the skin to bulge out and it turns out although I don't have the video for you yet, that you can actually create physical machines that now do something like you see in this, this video here. It's now becoming uh, a reality. So um, embodiment gets us to think differently about uh, creating artificially intelligent uh, machines. And soft robots in particular can change their body plans uh, even more, which allows us to think about even different, different ways, e even more possibilities for realizing artificially generally intelligent behavior. So now if we go back to this three-dimensional experimental space I laid out for you at the beginning of this lecture, we can think about lots of different ways of moving through the space and each vector, each trajectory through this space is a different algorithm or a different way of creating machines that are increasingly accurate. They are increasingly robust. They can perform more and more tasks successfully and they are increasingly embodied. They have not only more complex body plans, but they are able to change those body plans in increasingly complex and interesting ways. And we can now reformulate the question of uh, how to perform AI, basically, which is which of these trajectories will get us the most robust, accurate, and embodied robot uh, as possible. And I think I'm reaching my 40 minute limit. So I think I will stop there uh, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this very inspiring talk. I, I really- Fabio, I think you're still, I think you're still muted. I'm muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was really happy. Um, uh, yes, uh, thank you for this uh, really inspiring talk because uh, in particular the cube is really an enlightenment for me. I think it's a very nice way to, to, to put uh, the story together. Thank you. I guess uh, if there are questions from our global uh, audience, So, yeah.
If there are no questions, uh, actually, I have a question for you, Josh. Sure. Because you have been working for a, a very long time, since a very long time, uh, on evolutionary robotics and general evolutionary agriculture. Now, uh, deep learning is much more pop popular and uh, it seems to be more successful. Uh, but uh, as we know, deep learning can, can be seen as a third wave of neural networks. You expect something like that, because intrinsically, I think that the evolutionary approaches could be more open uh, to discover new, 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 new things. Uh, what do you expect from uh, evolutionary uh, in the future that's a very that's a very good question and i i have something here i wanted to show if you just give me one moment to find it i, I have a good good answer to that okay. yes uh, just give me one moment here okay for my screen Okay, I wanted to uh, show you a tweet here. This is from uh, Hard Maru or David Ha. He's a very uh, prominent researcher at Google. At Google. Um, he is sort of uh, doing some amazing work in deep learning. Um, and uh, he had an interesting tweet a couple weeks ago. And the tweet says, current robots are designed to work well with high precision control systems like deep reinforcement learning. Sometimes I wonder if it'll be easier to just learn better robot designs that work better with existing deep re reinforcement learning algorithms compared to trying to make deep reinforcement learning algorithms work better on existing robots. So I, I know David Ha and I, I like this tweet very much. Um, it's interesting that this tweet came from the, the heart of the deep learning community in 2000. Exactly. In 2018, this work has already been done by Carl Sims back in 1992. So it's taken almost 30 years for the machine learning and neural network community to start to think about questions that Carl Sims and the artificial life community were asking back in the 1980s and the 1990s. So. So obviously deep learning algorithms and, and deep reinforcement learning algorithms are extremely powerful. They've made a lot of progress, but the community as a whole now is asking about some of the worrying limitations they're seeing with these algorithms. Like for example, um, antagonistic examples. It turns out that it's surprisingly easy to generate training data that will fool a deep, a deep learner. And there doesn't seem to be from a theoretical point of view anything that can be done about that. Um, deep learning has also made limited progress with natural language understanding and generation so that that community knows that there are these limitations and there are a number of very prominent researchers working in that area who are starting to think now about morphology or, or what they call robot design. So my prediction is that in the next few years, we're going to see increased attention from the machine learning and the reinforcement learning community on morphology and embodiment. Um, it's taken 30 years for that to happen, but again, um, research is, it takes a long time. As, as we've learned in AI, intelligence is very difficult. It took, it took 30 or 40 years, depending on how you count, to actually perfect neural networks themselves. So maybe it'll take us another 30, 40, 50, 100 years to, to also make progress on, on embodiment. So I think that's, that's good news for the students that, out, that are out there. Um, you're not too late to the party. There's still a, a lot of interesting work to be done uh, in this area. But, but a, a very good question, Fabio. Thank you for, uh, also for your answer, which uh, is actually very interesting. So stimulating. Actually, you are right. Also for us, uh, there is still a lot of work to be do uh, to be done. So absolutely, uh, the field is really, I would say, even more exciting. So I think we're just at the beginning. We're just at yeah, the beginning. Exactly, it could be the infancy of uh, AI and robotics. That's right. Whatever you think of its successes, but already, I mean, considering the impact that the early successes are already having. 
this is probably the infant. It's a six months old baby. So a bit wild. <laughs> good, good metaphor. Absolutely. Very <laughs> Okay, I, I don't know if there are other uh, questions. Otherwise, uh, as told, uh, George uh, is uh, for sure happy to answer to any I know it can be I know it can be in intimidating to ask a question in this venue, but I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Yes. Yeah, always remember, I don't think that you are going to raise stupid questions, but Remember that there are no stupid questions. Uh, That's right. Only, and some of the stupid questions uh, are actually uh, questions that people don't write because they are too difficult to answer to. So. But I see that I will be uh, Ah, yes, there is a question for Xian. From Xian. Hello. Uh, thank you, Josh Bang. Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Dragon. I think it's better now. Go ahead. Uh, it's better now because I said that. Each year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, are there any killer application or practical application based on your research? Uh, uh, evolution of robotics, evolution of morphological issue, okay? any <laughs> uh, applications, okay? Uh, yes, I, I think the question was, uh, are there any killer applications for evolutionary robotics? Is that, that your question? Okay, so um, as we mentioned, it's sort of in, in the infancy, but there are some emerging uh, application species for this, um, and they relate to uh, soft robotics. So um, <laughs> with soft robotics, um, they can literally move into very small spaces that would be difficult or impossible for a rigid machine to enter. Um, however, in order to enter those small spaces, they need to reconfigure into a different shape. Um, and it turns out that um, programming a robot to change shape and change its control policy for that new shape is a very non-convex optimization problem. And traditional machine learning algorithms have a difficult time with those, those problems. So evolutionary algorithms are particularly useful there. Um, we have some colleagues that we're working with at Tufts University to, uh, again, turn some of these evolved designs and simulation into reality. And some of the applications um, that we're looking at with our Tufts colleagues are uh, medical applications, um, specifically uh, intelligent drug delivery. So if you swallow, uh, if you swallow some medication, part of that medication may have a robotic component that allows the robot to actually swim upstream or downstream into very small uh, capillaries and bring the medicine exactly to where it's required. So intelligent drug delivery is becoming a very uh, big topic here in the United States. And some approaches to that are robotic applications. And in our case, it's, it's soft robots. How does something actually deform to move into very small spaces? Um, that's one application. The other one is that the traditional application for robotics, which is helping at a disaster site. So if you have a very large area uh, of uh, unstable material after an earthquake, for example, um, that you would deploy some of these soft robots and they would be able to deform into very small spaces uh, and bring water to human survivors and also reconfigure to shore up unstable material until human rescue teams can reach uh, the survivor. So those are the two uh, applications that we work on. They're not uh, commercially available yet, but I, I see that as one possible killer, uh, two possible killer applications. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Still, we have a long, maybe have a long application. Agreed. Agreed. We have a long way to go. That's right. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Yeah, I also agree on this. Um, okay, so if there are not uh, other questions, I think uh, we, we can thank uh, again our speaker. And uh, yes, remember that uh, he, he will be happy to, so we, all the panelists, uh, or, or uh, he, he will be particularly happy, I think, to answer to your question. And uh, for the students uh, and, and the supervisors of the students uh, willing to send them to the US, uh, uh, actually, at the beginning, uh, Josh was, uh, <laughs> telling us that we have a number of uh, very cool uh, research uh, projects for uh, PhD students. Absolutely, yes. You, know, you, you may have get, uh, uh, got a flower for how cool could be. That would be great, yes. Please, please do send applications our way and uh, happy to answer any questions online. Okay. So, Josh, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for attending uh, the lecture. And see you next week. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. -bye.